Welcome, everyone. It's Friday, 3 o'clock Pacific time. You know what that means. It's career happy hour. So every Friday, we gather here today, this Friday, to actually take a pause and reflect on the past week and see, are we where we intend to be with our career? This is an opportunity to think about what we did well, what we could have done better, kind of like a you know an after action review on ourselves. Uh, I know one of the things in my career that I neglected to do earlier on in my career is really reflect on those things and then take action on some things that I could use do to develop myself. And I was always expecting my employer to do those things for me. So if you don't know me, I'm Andrew Beach. I'm a teacher of self-education. I help professionals communicate value to find great opportunities faster, whether they're working or not. That's through a pragmatic process of professional branding, planning, and effective networking, the three steps in my mind to career success. And today we're continuing our discussion. By the way, if you have any questions, just go ahead and put those in the chat or the comments, whether it's live during uh, our time here today or uh, it's uh, on replay. I, I monitor those uh, areas frequently. And if there's anything that comes up, please either send me a, put it in the comments or the chat or send me a direct message. You can most likely connect with me on LinkedIn. That would be um, linkedin.com slash in slash branding dynamo. That's, you see that handle on the screen here in, in front of us. So uh, good. So we're continuing our discussion today on networking. Now we did a book club, I think last year or maybe year before on uh, the other book that I find really helpful, which if you see my bookcase back here. I'll grab it really quickly. Should be easy. I got two copies. Actually, this is the, the hardcover copy. So it's uh, the National Business Employment Weekly. This to me is the recipe book on how to do networking. And, and so if you are the type of person that has an ABC one, two, three mindset, then this was this would be the, uh, the book that you would want. Uh, and this one, I think is a little more um, I think strategic. So it's thinking strategic, more high level. You know, who are the types of people you'd want in your network? It gives consideration to that. Uh, it also gives consideration to um, not just jobs or business, but life. And so I, I think it's a more universal book in that regard. And and so we're going to pick up from where we left off. I think it was on chapter 25, 24. Yeah. So chapter 24 in this book called Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty by Harvey Mackey. I think I, I just saw he's still alive. I think he just had his 90th birthday, if I remember correctly. You could probably find him on social media, but uh, he, he doesn't he doesn't look so much uh, that young. Just imagine him, a little more white hair, a little more wrinkles. Anyway, uh, I'm sure he'd appreciate the fact that we're, we're uh, celebrating his birthday by uh, reading through his book together. So you have any questions on this book or in, in regards to your career or questions you have about networking or or LinkedIn, uh, go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll answer those as we go along. So here we go. Chapter 24, plugging into your network. Your network isn't the only network you should know. You should get to know inside and out. Get to know your boss's core network too. Everybody has their own kitchen cabinet. When the people the boss listens to become part of the, your own network, you have that uh, alternate route to get to the boss information you think he or she needs to hear. I've seen, uh, I'll, I'll pause right there. So that this is one of the values actually of having maybe skip level meetings. So if I have a boss that's a director, I'd want to meet with the VP, that sort of thing, and, and build relationships that way uh, outside of just the normal, I suppose, chain of command. So it makes sense to kind of build a, a circular circular network around your leader or your boss or the VP or the person that you think is going to be most influential in getting work done or seeing you as a, a, an opportunity for advancement. This approach also works with bosses who listen mostly to themselves. Find out what their interests are and you not only have an insight into their personalities, but a means of networking with them on another level. These are the right routes to take. Here's a wrong one. So here's what's not to do. In his book, in his book, Mean Business, How I Save Bad Companies and Make Good Companies Great, 
Chainsaw Al Dunlap modestly writes, I'm a superstar in my field. Much like Michael Jordan in basketball and Bruce St Springsteen in rock and roll, in his third day after asking, uh, taking over troubled Sunbeam, if you know, they make, uh, I think, small electricals like uh, microwaves. I think we have a Sunbeam microwave where he very quickly fired half the workforce. Wow, sounds like, uh, um, who is it? Elon Musk and Twitter. Dunlap addressed his front office troops and suggested that if they wanted to learn more about his management methods, they might buy his book. One employee asked how much it cost. I'd say that person, one, should polish up on his networking act, and two, is probably no longer with Sunbeam. Mackey's Maxim. Rule number one, listen to your boss. Rule number two, know whom, who you're, know whom your boss listens to. Chapter 25, you show me yours and I'll show you mine. The most efficient way to expand your network is to trade networks with someone else. How big is your network? If you answered infinite, you're right. At this writing, you're limited only by the number of people on the planet. And that's if you don't count pets. I know several veterinarians who have made a very good living by being extra nice to the right dogs. But even if you limit it to humans, your network is potentially the size of all your contacts, plus all your relatives, friends, and contacts, and your business associates, contacts, and so on. Say you have to send out a mailing to advertise a charity event or introduce a new service you have to offer. Are you going to limit the list to just those names you've been able to scrape together? Of course not. You'll ask me for my list. And if I like the offer, I might even ask a few other people for their lists. Instead of a few hundred names, you now have a few thousand. A word of warning. Remember to treat everyone's contacts with the utmost respect. Like tightrope walking, this is a system based on balance and trust. A fall from grace, like a fall from the high wire, can be very hard to recover from. No truer words have, have been spoken, but the whole point of networking is to actually uh, connect your way to other people. And so the idea here is, is you show me yours and I'll show you mine. It's, it's you're trading these contacts. Mackey's Maxim. When, do, when two people exchange dollar bills, each has only one dollar. When two people exchange networks, they have two networks. Interesting. Chapter 26. Maximum effort, maximum results. Ray Kroc sold malted milk machines in Southern California in the late 1940s. His best customers were two brothers who ran a drive-in, a relatively new concept at the time. While most drive-ins were tacky affairs, this operation was well-lit and clean with a wholesome family atmosphere, uniform quality at a fair price, and a volume that far outstripped all of Kroc's other customers. Kroc was a driven man. He knew the brothers were on to something, and he wanted to be a part of it. He tried to persuade them to expand so he could increase his own sales to them, but they were content with what they had. Kroc finally persuaded them to sell their concept to him, and he retained their name for, the, for his company, McDonald's. Kroc found a Calvin Coolidge quote that expressed his business philosophy and posted it on the wall of every McDonald's. Here's what it reads. Press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education alone will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Persistence and determination. Now, of course, that can go too far when we're talking about networking. I mean, how far is too far? Well, I mean, uh, if, if someone's not uh, responding to your outreaches or, or connections, then certainly you want to move on, move on to somebody else or give them a break. Several years ago, I met Dennis P. Kimbrough, a man who makes Ray Kroc look like a hopeless underachiever. Think of me as the McDonald's brothers struggling along, fairly content with what I had. Too busy and not interested in stretching or expanding my network as I could have been. Because I'm on the road about 150 days a year, I am not always accessible. You don't have to tell that, that to Dennis. He experienced it firsthand. Over a period of about three months, Dennis had tried contacting me by phone. He made 15 calls. 
15. He was zero for 15. He got lots of fancy excuses, but no Harvey. For his 16th at bat, Dennis had had enough. He tried a new stance. He called my assistant and threw a sincere temper tantrum. What do I have to do to talk to Mr. Mackey? My gatekeeper has been trained to withstand these onslaughts. She does not budge. However, she did explain that I would be on five airplanes in the next five days. So as you can see, Mr. Kimbrough, it will be next to impossible to contact him. Obviously, next to impossible is not impossible, not to Dennis P. Kimbrough anyway. If you will give me the flight number of any one of those flights, said Kimbrough, just the flight number, I don't even have to know the seat assignment. I will be on that flight sitting next to Mr. Mackey. I will promise you. I will only talk to him for 300 seconds, a tactic he picked up from one of my earlier books. I will not be a pest. I will not bother him. He will be able to get his work done. Three days later on Northwest Flight 569, New York to Denver, my mystery date is sitting next to me looking like the cat who swallowed the canary. He introduced himself, whipped out a legal pad filled with notes, pressed down a button on the timer on his watch, and held it up to me so I could see. As the seconds began to tick off, he said, I've got 300. Make that 295 seconds to ask you for help, and then I'll leave you alone. I've written a book titled Think and Grow Rich, a black choice. Years ago, Napoleon Hill, the author of Think and Grow Rich, had been uh, begun a manuscript on the question of how black Americans who are born poor can reach their full potential. Independently of Hill, I had done extensive research on the subject. I have a doctorate from Northwestern, and I was commissioned to update, expand, and finish the manuscript. It reveals how successful Black Americans achieve their dreams and how other Black Americans can apply the same principles in their own lives. For four years, I've been, excuse me, I said, you can stop the timer for now. I have to ask you a question. Do the principles include persistence and determination? Why, yes, said Dennis, grinning. I suspect he knew what was coming next. Obviously, I haven't read your book, but it's pretty clear to me you know what you're talking about. Dennis had done his homework. Not only did he know enough to approach me by using one of my own gambits, he also knew that he needed an agent. First-time authors seldom get their manuscripts past editors, slush piles, unless they've got an agent. Having an agent put his or her reputation on the line on your behalf of an author alerts the publisher that this is a manuscript that deserves their consideration. I also would ask you to read it and give me your own views and if you think it has merit. Help me develop a strategy to get some key endorsements and jacket blurbs. By this time I knew what if his book, I knew that if his book has anything like his marketing strategy, it should be a winner. I helped him get an agent, mine, Jonathan Lazier, and some plugs he could use in the marketing, including my own. Think and, Think and Grow Rich, a black choice, has been a huge success. It has sold 100,000 hardcover copies and gone through 10 printings. Dennis has been on the Today Show, Larry King, CNN, and CNBC. He's been featured in Ebony Magazine and interviewed and quoted extensively in many major news publications. He is now the director of the Center of Entrepreneurship at Clark Atlanta University, the only program of its type in the nation housed at an historically black college or university. As I write this, he's working on his second book, What Makes the Great Great. Dennis P. Kimbrough, PhD, has made a career as an expert on the habits of highly successful people. He is a living example of his own favorite subject. I am proud to be part of Dennis Kimbrough's network and proud that he is part of mine. I have benefited as such or more from our association than he has. The first person I called when I was in Atlanta for the Olympics was Dennis. The first person I knew I would write about when I began this book was Dennis. There's only one reason that I ever connected with Dennis, his persistence and determination. You can build your own network exactly the same way. Do it, even if it takes more than 16 phone calls. 16 phone calls and a, a plane ride. Mackey's Maxim. Cream doesn't rise to the top, it works its way up. And that concludes step four. We now go to step five. Step five is excavate your unique skills. I wonder what that has to do with, with networking. Hmm. Maybe you could put your observations in the comments. Chapter 27, 
there's nothing worse than looking at a deer caught in your own, in your headlights. Uh, do you want to feel comfortable? Do what you feel comfortable doing and do, do a little bit more, especially when you are first starting to network. Everyone should learn to stretch beyond their comfort zone. Don't push yourself to the point where all, all of that people see and remember are a cold sweat and a frozen smile. Forced jobs are worse than no contact at all. I remember once meeting the daughter of the president of the United States at a fundraiser. I won't tell you which daughter of which president because I don't want to embarrass her. And let me remind you that Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton all have at least one daughter. So you can't be sure who she is. Anyway, I met this young woman for possibly five seconds in a reception line. And the only reason I remember the meeting is that I have never seen anyone so miserable in my life. Even though I had contributed to the election of her dad, I ended up voting against him because anyone who could put his kid through that kind of torture would be willing to put my kid through a lot worse. This is exactly the kind of impression you are trying not to make. <laughs> wow. So that was the whole, oh, I missed it. Not to me. Okay, good. Mar <laughs> Mackie's Maxim. One reason that people are afraid to network is that they don't want to hear the word no. But no is the second best answer there is. At least you know where you stand. Chapter 28, Butcher, Baker, Envelope Maker. If you're not a public figure, then there's the inevitable moment when the question comes up, what do you do? I'm in favor of a multiple choice answer because it gives the other person a couple of ways to connect. I usually say something like, one, I sell envelopes. Two, I write self-help books. And three, I jog. I'm always looking for ideas for one and two and always trying to figure out how to get paid for number three. <laughs> so whatever the, your, your gig is, put a little pizzazz in your answer when someone asks you, what do you do? And prepare it carefully, even though when you give it, you'll want to toss it off without sounding as if you're reciting name, rank, and serial number. It's probably the one question you're sure to be asked, and apart from your name, the one thing people will remember about you. So you want to use your answer effectively to help build your network. Now, some of us might call that a branding statement or, a, a, you know, so his branding statement was just three things. That works. Uh, and, and it's memorable. So if I was wanting to remember somebody that had a certain, I don't know, uh, profile, then that's what I would remember about them. Mackey's Maxim. Uh, there's a reason they call them connections. You have to connect. Good point. Chapter 29. I like these one and two page chapters. They're nice. Now, this one might be longer, so I don't want to speak too soon. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, chapter 29. Be a differentiator and dot, dot, dot. One of the purposes of networking is to get you to stand out from the pack. If you network successfully, you become known as the person who remembers birthdays, can be counted on to praise a promotion your client just received, and someone who always is just a phone call away. But what happens when anyone everyone starts to do those things. And you no longer stand out. This is a problem, especially as more and more people begin to understand the power of networking, or I hope, read this book. What do you do to make sure you stand out? You have to use your imagination. And if you have to take the extra step, let me give you three quick examples. Three quick examples. Number one, don't ever send another business Christmas card. Oh sure, they are lovely. Sending cards is a nice gesture and everyone does it, but that is exactly the point. Everyone does it. And because they do, nobody remembers them. Want proof? Ask yourself this. When was the last Christmas card you remember receiving at the office? Don't get lost in the crowd. Instead of sending Christmas cards, send Thanksgiving cards. There are great ones out there. Your card will likely be the first holiday impression a person gets. So you're swimming upstream. This is, you know, so these are like marketing and um, I would say sales tactics. So they apply not just in networking, but in different contexts. And that's really, I think, where Harvey is coming from is from a, a sales perspective. Always use a beautiful commemorative stamp. Include a one paragraph handwritten personal note on the card. And for the resourceful reader, send out birthday cards. Two, be polite. You don't think this will make you stand out? You're wrong. We are all too time stressed. We never can get it all done. These days, the person who responds quickly to a phone call 
or to a note has discovered a true way to be a differentiator. One of the stories uh, that's told about Billy Graham involves an incident that occurred while he was in a dinner with some staff members. When the waitress served the group recognizing Billy, she dropped her tray, scattering dishes all over the place. Graham immediately leaped up and helped her clean up the mess. How many of us would reach out to another person and help her through an embarrassing moment? Billy Graham's act to find good manners, consideration for the feelings of others. Three, send a creative present to their kids. That sounds a little creepy to me. I wouldn't want somebody sending something to my kids. Just saying. But let's see what he has to say. Be honest. What can you possibly get the big kahuna that is actually going to impress her? But if you get her 10-year-old son an automated uh, an autographed baseball from his favorite player or a get, uh, get a well-known person to send a handwritten note to her daughter, you probably won't have a lot of problems getting your phone calls returned. Geraldine Ladyborn, a Nickelodeon television executive, found herself seated next to the legendary Hollywood mogul Michael Ort Ovitz during last year's NBA playoffs. Though she had never met Ovitz, she struck up a conversation with his companion, who happened to be his nine-year-old son, Eric. Ovitz's pair was impressed, reported Leadership Magazine. Six months later, Ovitz, uh, at the time president of Walt Disney, called Lady Bourne and persuaded her to leave Nickelodeon to become president of the Disney ABC cable networks. In her new position, Lady Bourne will be the most visible woman executive in broadcasting, according to leadership. She's already proven that she's one of the best networkers in the network business. Mackie's Maxim. What do you have to offer that makes you memorable? What connects you with the person you most want to be remembered by? Sometimes it's just paying it forward. I think that that's probably the most memorable thing is who is there in, in good times and bad, maybe more often in the bad times. And how did they, how did you support them being, being helpful, successful in some way or, or getting through that, that difficult time? Let's see chapter 30. We're just rocking these. They're all one page chapters. So I like it. And they'll never forget you. So this is a, a, a continuation of the prior chapter. So be a differentiator and they, they will never forget you. So it's, uh, chapter 30. Some things are so basic we overlook them. For example, you don't have a network if they can't remember your name. Wow. No truer words spoken. You don't have a network if they can't remember your name. Armand Bucci found uh, has found a way to deal with that by being the ultimate differentiator. Many times I'm introduced to, so to someone new and they have a difficult time remembering my name. Usually I get Carmen... Herman or Arnold, I give them my card on the back. Of, it has different ways to spell my name. They may not remember my name the next time, but they do remember I'm the guy with the card. When he does, when he was job hunting, he enclosed a flyer with his resume. It went, if we had to live with 99.9% .9 effort, we would have one hour of unsafe drinking water every month, two unsafe plane landings per day at O'Hare, 16,000 pieces of lost mail every hour, 22,000 checks deducted from the wrong bank account every week, 500 incorrect surgical operations every week, 12 babies given to the wrong parents, 20,000 incorrect drug prescriptions each year, 800,000 credit cards with incorrect information. A 100% effort makes sense. Armand Bucci. Armand says that this helped me get my current position even though my background may have not been as strong as 150 others who applied for the job. Mackey's Maxim. If people keep saying, tell me your name again, either A, you mumble, or B, you aren't doing enough to make an impression. Chapter 31, The Return of the One-Armed Man. Philosophers believe that the World Wide Web will change the fundamental way we view each other, and that, that has happened. Uh, so again, this is, I think, a book from the 90s, if I remember right, telling you last time. Uh, I don't want to speak out of place, but uh, I want to make sure I have the right date. Um, let's see. Rolodex. Okay. Da, 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 da. Originally published uh, by Doubleday in 1997. So this is 1997. So um, .com started, really started in 1997, 98, and uh, blew up in, you know, 2001. But anyway, that's or two, after you, year 2000. Um, philosophers believe that the World Wide Web will change the fundamental way we view each other. 
Networks formed via the internet will not necessarily be based on race, class, gender, or creed. Disabilities disappear. Opportunities arise in new forms. Some people think the deck is stacked against them. Mike Brewer can't even shuffle the deck. He only has one good arm. Yet when his, his handicap threatened to end one career, he managed to use the internet as his bridge to another. When we first met Mike Brewer in my last book, Shark Proof, he was scratching out a living as a photographer in Hawaii, shooting the showcase homes dotting the Kauai hillside for the real estate industry. The most dramatic and desirable shots and the toughest and most dangerous to obtain are overheads. A pilot flies a helicopter over the site and the photographer hangs out an open door and shoots uh, the picture. Not many two-armed photographers are willing to take those shots. One-armed Mike Brewer was hanging out the helicopters leg wrapped around the pole in the open doorway. Brewer shot his pictures with one good arm. After Hurricane Eva hit, Brewer went airborne again immediately. This time he photographed the destruction. He got his pictures before the National Guard could clear away the debris and obliterate evidence of the high watermark, the boundary line for many pay, no pay insurance company decisions. By the time the insurance company claim agent showed up, Brewer was the only person in the world who had exactly what they needed before and after pictures that accurately showed the destruction caused by the hurricane. Brewer knew what he had and what it was worth. Over the next few weeks, he made more money than he had made in any single year in his entire life. Eventually, the money ran out, and even his good arm, the one that had not been struck by polio originally, began to weaken. He knew he couldn't spend the rest of his life waiting for hurricanes. Brewer had a satellite downlink TV scanner. Among the hundreds of stations it, it brought in was the Boise Educational TV station sponsored by the University of Idaho. Using the net, he contacted the university and discovered it had gotten a huge grant from the National Science Foundation. The university had used some of it to buy computers, linking up with high schools across the Northwest, using the network to teach physics and simple computer graphics. It was sending photographic images over the network and needed a photographer to help develop the graphics and work the program. Brewer left Hawaii for Boise and signed up with the TV station. He had to learn computer graphics from the ground up, and he needed to research other programs in other states if he was going to help develop a program for Idaho and win more grant money. Instead of hanging out of helicopters, he began hanging out on the internet. <laughs> Funny. Most major internet success. First major internet success. Access to the U.S. Department of Education downlink for a computer training program for persons with physical disabilities. Second major internet success. National Endowment for the Humanities grant to fund the first storytellers. On a tip from a forest fire crew, Brewer had learned of prehistoric paintings located in caves in the most remote areas of Idaho. The grant would pay for him to fly in, raft in, and film in 15 of these seldom seen places. Now he just needed permission. Third major internet success, U.S. Forest Service for permits to film in these deeply hidden locations and create images for their archives. Brewer's filming has now been completed and tied into other cave paintings found in the West. Soon, everyone will be able to see his work on CD-ROM or on the internet. Mike's project, Primitive Art on the Net, is a unique combination of one foot in the past, one foot in the future. Though he is slowly losing the use of his remaining arm, Brewer has made the transition from freelance daredevil photographer to computer-based programmer and internet specialist. But, so what I learned from that is, you know, learn new skills, adapt, uh, find a new opportunity. Don't don't be afraid to relocate if that opportunity sounds, um, how would you say, uh, intriguing enough. And, and so don't don't overlook those opportunities. In fact, consider those opportunities and maybe look at those as an, a way to make sure that you're kind of on the right path for yourself. Networking for grants and educational and employment opportunities made it possible for him, for him to continue his remarkable career. Currently, he's using the network to search for hot links to jobs for graphic art and web page design. A lot of this has been solved. I mean, there's there's uh, all kinds of uh, web um, tools out there. LinkedIn has a, um, a services page. I think there's Upwork. Um, Fiverr, I think, was really popular for a while. So there's there's ways to to find these different exchanges where you can find work, freelance work.
As I write this, he is attending a federal webmasters conference in Washington, D.C. On surprise, still another grant he snared by networking the net. Of course, he also has his own webpage. You can email Mike on the internet at mbrewer at cyberhighway.net. I wonder if that email still works. mbrewer, B-R-E-W-E-R, at cyber, C-Y-B-E-R, highway.net. Mackey's maxim, one good head is better than two good arms. So true. So that, that's the moral of the story. One good head is better than two good arms. Chapter 32, well, we're, we're buzzing through these. It doesn't matter where you start, it's where you finish. My first job pushing broom in Charlie Ward's gold mine was not the fulfillment of my life's ambition. I may not have had such business, much business experience, but somewhere along the line, I had bought into the conventional wisdom that there was no such thing as a good job with a broom. Well, I was wrong. And so is today's version of that homily for which you can substitute flipping burgers for the broom part. I learned some things behind Charlie's broom that stuck with me, like showing up on time, dressing neatly, showing respect to others, doing your job, demonstrating the willingness to do more than uh, was expected of me. Uh, reputation. So this is reputation management, if you think about it from that perspective, is that we're, we're all called to uh, a reputation and it's either on purpose or an accident. But people are formulating beliefs about us based on, on how we behave in the marketplace. Uh, in those days, I wouldn't have known what a network was if I tripped over one. But my gut instinct told me that if I could figure out who it was I had to impress with my newly acquired little businessman qualities, I would be able to put the broom down as soon as possible. Sure enough, within a couple months, I had been paroled from the plant and was in the sales department. All it took was one, being the best broom man of my generation. So do your job and do it well. Two, being sure that the assistant plant manager knew it. So it's not good enough to do your job and do it well. You have to tell people how well you've been doing it. Three, having had the good fortune to have a lot latched on to a guardian angel someone who was equally eager to escape the gold mine and who took me with him when he wrangled his way into sales. So having a, a wingman or a wing person, I talk about that a lot on my podcast, Job Seekers Radio. Uh, it wasn't until last year at my own shop, Mackey Envelope Corporation, that I learned that the multiple player deal the assistant plant manager and I had pulled off 40 years earlier had a name, the sausage theory. When one person moves up the chain of command, at least one other moves up too. In 1993, after a year-long nationwide search for a president of Mackey Envelope, I had a few candidates who were nines on a 10-point scale, but no tens. We started over. We'd been looking in the wrong, wrong nation. We found our 10, Scott Mitchell, running a division of a Canadian-based company, more business forms. When we pitched Scott, he expressed his concern for the people who had moved up the ladder with him at Moore. At the time of his last promotion, when he had moved from vice president of sales to head of the division, the vice presidents of marketing, manufacturing, and his second in command had moved up with him. The sausage theory in action. One link moves, the other links follow. When Scott came to work at Mackey Envelope, he... Um, it happened again. His former second-in-command moved up to Scott's old slot as president. He has now moved, thanks to Scott, to president of one of our largest envelope customers. Good placement, wouldn't you say? Scott's former subordinates in human resources, marketing, and manufacturing also have moved to more responsible jobs. All of them, in, incidentally, are Mackey Envelope customers. Now, that's uh, a worst at its best, meaning a brought worst. Uh, your career can be linked with careers of others. As your mentors move up, so can you, especially if you have been a key contributor in their promotion or success. It doesn't matter how far down the food chain you are when you start out. Networking can pay off big time. In some businesses, such as the movie industry, you must pay your, your dues. Pay your dues. They start you off uh, in a major hole and see whether you can work your way out of it. There isn't an extensive worth, there isn't an executive worth his Humvee who didn't start out in the mailroom, the cinematic version of the broom thing. It's like boot camp. Some make it, some don't. Mackey's maxim. There are no dead-end jobs. There are only dead-end people. If you build a network, you will have a bridge to wherever you want to go. That is so key. 
so key, especially when we're talking in era right now. I mean, if, if I talked to you a year and a half, two years ago, uh, companies couldn't find talent. There were more jobs available than people to fill them. Uh, some people were, uh, I think, taking, I don't know, a gap year or perhaps uh, um, starting their own business or consulting efforts. It doesn't mean they wouldn't be interested in going back to corporate work or working for a company. It just means there was not supply available of qualified talent. And today, it might be a different story. Things are kind of flattening out. We might be headed to a recession. Inflation is high. Supply chains are still kind of interrupted. Um, there's a lot of forces at play here that could create a situation where there aren't enough jobs for the people that need them. So take, take, that, uh, take that advice. If you build a network, you will have a bridge to wherever you want to go in good times or in bad. Uh, and so I think I'll pause there, see if there's any questions here. Doesn't appear there is. So we can keep going. Chapter 33. Uh, take my network, please. From the category of Life Imitates Art, 10 years ago, I was in New York to tape a television commercial for my first book. Unless you count semi-celebrity status in Midwest envelope manufacturing circles, I was a total unknown. My first time author, a uh, first time author and a first time TV pitch man. I showed up half an hour early at the studio. There on the set in living color was Larry King, holding up his latest book and doing his own commercial. To set the scene properly, it has to be pointed out that Larry, playing Larry King live is to authors as playing uh, the palace was to jugglers. He was just finishing up. We were introduced, I went to work, he went to the phone. 10 minutes later, the director patted me on the back, said, we're done and I headed for the elevator. King was leaving at the same time. We made a little small talk on the way down. When we reached the door, his stretch limo was waiting curbside. I started to hail a cab. <clears throat> he looked a little embarrassed, motioned to me and said, which way are you headed? At this point, visions of the King, <laughs> the King of Comedy, a movie that had opened fairly recently, fast flashed through my head. In it, Robert De Niro plays the wonderfully named Rupert Pumpkin. P Pumpkin a totally obnoxious and untalented jerk who is obsessed with getting on the talk show hosted by the character played by Jerry Lewis. They first met when this unsuspecting Lewis offers De Niro a ride in his limo. The Park Lane Hotel, I said, pupkin-like. Hop in, said King. It was only a few blocks, a few blocks to make an impression, a few blocks to be a differentiator, a few blocks to avoid any further traces of pupkinism. If there is any single rule to follow under these circumstances, it's not how can I get the other person to do something for me? It's how can I do something for the other person? I didn't know King's background. I didn't know his likes or his dislikes. I didn't know any organizations he belonged to. I didn't know the names of his kids. I didn't know of a single characteristic, interest, or goal that he and I had in common. By this time, the limo had already started to pull up to the hotel, and then a light bulb went off in my head. Nothing in common except for one thing. The reason we had gone to the studio. We both had written books we wanted to sell. Mr. King, I hope I'm not overreaching here, but I assume you, like me, showed up at the studio because we'd both like to sell a ton of our books. Right on, kid. That's why I write them. King's limo had now pulled up outside the entrance of the hotel with the motor running. I may not have known anything about King, but I had done my homework on the publishing business. I began to spill my guts about what I had learned. My self-designed, self-taught course had taken me nearly six months. I had talked with over 30 authors, a slew of literary agents, a dozen publishers, a few promotional firms, and six lawyers. I told Larry King that I had heard the same message over and over. Many, many good books never see the light of day due to poor promotion, but all the money in the world can't sell a bad book. Really? Have you ever heard of Ingram? I said, no. Well, not many people have, even though they're the largest book wholesaler in the country. Most people don't even realize that books are wholesaled. They think all a retailer has to do is pick up the phone and call the publisher and order the books. But there's a catch. It takes the publisher three to five days to get the books in the hands of the bookseller if they haven't run out entirely, in which case they have to go back to press and they can take up to two weeks or longer. If that's a 
a hot book, that's an eternity, I continued. You wouldn't care to wait three to five days to get a magazine or newspaper you wanted. You'd want it now. Books are like that too, a little like fish. You want them fresh and you don't, uh, or you don't want them. Wholesalers have warehouses strategically placed around the country. If a hot book hits and the retailer sells out, they can call the wholesaler and it's instant delivery, sometimes the same day, but never more than 24 hours. It so happens that Phil Pfeiffer, the president of Ingram, is a good friend of mine. I met him. Edgar, turn off the engine, please, said Larry King. Ten years ago, uh, I met him 10 years ago at a business conference, and we've stayed in touch ever since. I visited Ingram. They have more than 100 talented salespeople stationed by the phones day and night taking orders. Now, here's the Quinella. When a store manager calls from Kokomo, Indiana and says, we're out of Stephen King's new book, please ship, ship us 50 more, the astute phone seller takes the order and then just might add, say, speaking of King, we've got a new book that just came in. It's Larry King's latest. How about I toss in a dozen of them? I met the author last week. He was here and he sure is a good storyteller with a terrific message. I bet your customers will like it. King was now on the edge of his seat, just staring at me. Even Edgar had turned around to listen. King did not have to ask me what came next. A month ago, Phil Pfeffer had me down to his Nashville headquarters. I gave a pep talk to his sales force and they had a book signing. My publisher had given me 100 books gratis to pass out to the Ingram sales force. If you'd like, I'd be glad to give Phil a call. And if you'd uh, care to make a trip to Nashville, those people would go crazy to have you call on them. You could give a short speech, do a book signing. And by the way, did I mention Len Riggio? He's head of Barnes and Noble and B. Dalton. No, you didn't mention Len Riggio, King said dryly. I, don't, I didn't know him when I went to see him. His buyers had placed a rather small opening order of my book. I wanted to give him an idea about what I would be doing by way of promoting it, hoping he'd up the ante. And I told him that I'd be going on a 35 city tour, radio, TV, newspapers, the whole bit. And that I'd be happy to always mention on every single show I was on that every newspaper interview I had that you can buy the book at your favorite bookseller. But Len knew I meant B. Dalton. So I said, perhaps your people could reevaluate their buy and maybe increase it from 1,500 to 15,000 books. I'm quite sure you won't be disappointed. And also, Mr. Riggio, I said, I have a good memory and I'll continue to talk up B. Dalton if I ever write another book or two or three. Seven days later, B. Dalton ordered 15,000 hardcover books from my publisher. Of course, when I went to Walden Books and Crown to ask why they would be ordering a token amount of books when B. Dalton had ordered 15,000, Seven days later, Walden Books ordered 15,000 and Crown went from zero to 10,000. King continued to stare. I began to climb out of the limo. By the way, do you happen to know Rupert Pupkin? I asked. Pupkin? Sounds familiar. Who is he? Just a guy. Kind of a pest. I think you'd probably want to avoid him. <laughs> I didn't think it would surprise anyone that I, I've been on Larry King Live six times. We talked about the books I'd written. We talked about the marketing books. I never mentioned Rupert Pupkin again. Mackey's Maxim, in networking, you're only as good as what you give away. You're only as good as what you give away. I think this is a good time to stop. Uh, so that will, we'll, we'll pick up chapter 34 next week. And thanks for keeping me on track here. We're a little over halfway through the book and we should be able to finish it up be before the end of the year. So thank you for joining me this week for Career Happy Hour. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Friday.